Well, good morning. We are in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8. It's a lengthy passage, but we hope to cover that. This is the Word of God. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in the front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men, women, and those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. While lifting up their hands, then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiai, Maseiah, Kelita, Azariah, Yozabad, Hanan, Peleah, the Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to, said to all the people, The day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, and to send portions, and to ce celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words to which they had been made known to them. Then on the second day, the heads of fathers' households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills. And bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, and there was great rejoicing. He read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day, and they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and our time this morning. Please join me in prayer. This is what he does. It's interesting. We find out some of you have, uh, may have grown up in a more um, Armenian background. Uh, not Armenian, but Armenian background. And um, where you could plan your revival. And especially if you're from a small town, they would have these. That the revival is happening this Thursday and Friday night. Please come. And the more you study scripture, the more you find out actually you can't plan God's revivals. It's just not even possible. Actually, the Latin word where we get our English term from, it's vivere. It means to live. And then you'd put the Latin uh, prefix re in front of it. And the idea is that it lives again. Revival. It shows something that lives again. Now, for, and it's two different groups of people, as you know. If you're a believer, when revival comes into your life, you, of course, are living but there are certain times if you consider your own life that you go, I feel like God just ratcheted me up in sanctification. 
I'm still wicked, not denying that, but it's just he's done something in my life to bring about some rapid change. That's revival in a Christian's life. For an unbeliever, God actually raises the dead, right, and gives them new life. The idea, once again, is regeneration. He regenerates them and gives them new life. What you find out is Jesus makes us very clear that it is his priority and prerogative to do it. In John 3, it says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. This is God's work. Now, what's fascinating, though, is that not simply that he does it, but that he does it through his word. God thought it incredibly important for us to be able to know his word. He could have come to us in any fashion, but he wanted us to be reading people, to be able to hear the word preached and taught. And so what you find out is in the dead center of every revival is the word of God. The the reformers understood that. To give you another Latin word, reforme, that's where the church was reformed, right? Our ancestors were a part of that broke away from the Roman Catholic Church that really was no longer teaching the gospel. A person is saved by faith alone. And they would say, you know this term as the reforming of the church. God was bringing out his people, right? So the, uh, the reformers held to this in church history. You also find another group of people that some of them are kind of my heroes called the Puritans. They didn't get everything right. There's no, there's no perfect class of Christians out there. They were big sinners like us, but they held strongly to the Bible. The Puritans were kind of the, the kids and the grandkids of the Reformers, spiritually speaking. Listen to what J.I. Packer says about them, and this is what we should long for as part of the church. Puritanism, Puritanism was above all else a Bible movement. To the Puritan, the Bible was in truth the most precious possession that this world affords. His deepest conviction was that reverence for God means reverence for Scripture. And serving God means obeying Scripture. To his mind, therefore, no greater insult could be offered to the Creator than to neglect his written word. And conversely, there could be no truer act of homage to him than to prize it, to pour over it, than to live it out and give out its teaching. So that's what we're going to see today in the story of this revival that God is going to bring. Before we go there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background Uh, We're going to see that the wall of Jerusalem was destroyed. And y'all, it lay flat for roughly 140 years. The Babylonians came, they destroyed Jerusalem. And then you have 140 years later, a guy named Nehemiah, and it's it's a miracle of God. He rebuilds in 52 days. It's amazing. It's, It's all glory to God. And so what we'll see here is that Nehemiah, after rebuilding the wall, he doesn't go back to Persia. Why not? Well, because I think we'll see is his concern was not simply the physical safety of the people, but the spiritual input and lives of the people. You see, for Nehemiah, he understood what Scripture teaches. Unless the hearts of the people have changed, the wall won't help them, right? Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord rather builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep watch in vain. So Nehemiah is going to stick around as we'll see revival break out in the Spirit of God working through the Word of God. Let's dive in. Chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Now, note this they're gathering as one man. That means everybody is coming to this. And you will already note the first mark, if you will, of, of these people that's, that revival is taking place. The first mark is what? They want, to, they want the Bible. As a matter of fact, Ezra doesn't come to them and say, hey, would you all like to study the scriptures together? They go to Ezra and say, bring it. Bring the word to us. And this is what is happening. Uh, notice this, though. They're not going to the temple. The temple is the official place of the gathering of the teaching but they don't go there, and there's a, there's, no one really knows exactly why, but there could be a reason here. Instead, they go to the most popular place in town called Watergate. Now, try to remove Nixon from your mind at this point. 
the water gate was the most popular place in town because that's where you would go to gather water from the Gihon Spring. But if you will also note this, God in his sweet providence, what is water a picture of in the scripture? It's a spirit, the spirit of God. In John 7, when Jesus is at the feast, he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The idea is when we are baptized, we are plunged into the water. It's not only just a cleansing agent. The idea is that you are in Christ and you are, the Spirit is in you. And it's fascinating, I think, that the Spirit so directs the people in Ezra to go to the water gate. Well, here we see, who is Ezra the scribe? And that's worth noting. Keep in mind, there's been three returns from Babylonian captivity. The first one was under Zerubbabel, where they would rebuild the temple. The next is under Ezra, the priest, and he's also a scribe, and he rebuilds the people through the teaching of Scripture. And then the third group that came back under Nehemiah, and they rebuild the wall. So they go to Ezra, and they say, bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord has given to Israel. So the Spirit is drawing the people to it, and they want to read basically the five books, the Torah. It's ultimately Israel's instruction book on how to walk with God. I think it's interesting. The people don't want a new book and how to build a nation. They need the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 says, Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Can't tell you the number of people that have, have mentioned to me, hey, what do you read with your family regarding, um, you know, for devotionals, for devotions. Well, we, we read the Word. Last time I checked, it's the only book written by God. So I think too many times we may be too quick to draw other rivers instead of the one life-giving river of the Scriptures. And this is what these people are doing. If there's any hope, ladies and gentlemen, for this nation and a great awakening, if there's any hope, even in our own families and lives, any hope, then the Spirit of God has got to step in and use the Word of God to change us. Christian, stop thinking somehow that psychology will help you. Psychology is based upon uh, false moorings. It's the Bible. Stop thinking that politics will help you. Of course, we should vote responsibly. And for the one that most lines up with our beliefs about Scripture, but at that point, we need to realize that ultimately God's the one who changes hearts. Only God can do this. Verse 2 and 3, Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding. And that would obviously be the children here. On the first day of the seventh month, he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand... And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now something to keep in mind is in the first day of the seventh month, that would be the day that you would observe the Feast of Trumpets. Note that, because we'll talk about that in just a moment. It's where the priests would blow the trumpets, assemble the people, there would be no work, uh, and you would signal the preparation for the Day of Atonement. So hold that, and we'll come back to it. And it says here, he read before the square. That means he gave attention to the public reading of Scripture. This is what we do here at the chapel. And this is what is called for in 1 Timothy 4.13. Why is it so important? Why can't I just have my own small devotional life, time in the Word? Why do I have to hear the public reading? Because God knows it's good for you. All right? We're all auditory learners in some sense because God knows it's good for us to hear it. But keep in mind, for the history of the church, when did we get the printing press? The 1500s? That means for the first 1500 years of the church, you couldn't have your own uh, scriptures? No. As a matter of fact, there's, there's documented evidence that they would actually chain the Bibles to the pulpit so people wouldn't steal a Bible. Because that's, many times that's all they would have in that congregation. So your understanding of the Scripture came on Sundays, not every day of the week. Although you would certainly hope for that and you would pray for that, but very few people, actually even if you could get your hands on your own Bible, what would be the problem? You can't read, right? As a matter of fact, that's why I'm so impressed 
with Massachusetts in the 1600s. 1647, they had a, a law called the Old Deluder Satan Act of 1647. That one sounds scary. But the idea is that Satan is such, such a deluder. He's, he deceives people so that if you got 50 households in a town, you were required under law to hire a teacher who could teach the kids to read and write. Why? Because the Puritans knew the same thing as the Bible teaches. And that is this. God revives people through the Spirit, and the Spirit revives people through the Word. And this is what you see. It's, it's fascinating to me that God put Psalm 119 right in the middle of the Bible. Because over and over and over again, you see this idea of God gives me life through His Word. He gives me life through His Word. Psalm 119, verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction that your Word has revived me. Psalm 119, verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your Word. I've just listed two. There's several. Check it out. So notice how long this sermon was. It says literally in the Hebrew, from light till midday. That was six hours of preaching. Lock the doors. Let's go ahead and try it. Um, and you go, how in the world could they have done that? Well, folks, I think it's interesting to note. If you're honest, you listen to what you revere. Right? Right? If you could care less about it, you don't listen. But if you revere something or someone, you listen to them, right? And if you revere God's word, you listen to it. And so, to give you an example of this, uh, Spurgeon tells a story about Roland Hill. He was an 18th century preacher. And he was dealing with people who said, you know, I, listening to the sermon, it's hard because the delivery of the preacher, I don't like the delivery. And so it's hard to listen and so he would, he would tell them this. You know, supposing you went to hear the will of your relatives read, and you were expecting a legacy from him. You would hardly think of criticizing the manner in which the lawyer read the will. Rather, you would be all attention to hear whether anything was left to you, and if so, how much. This is how, this is the way to hear the gospel preached. Yeah, because it's not me. It's the word. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand. And Pediah, Mishael, Mil Milkiah, Hashum, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. For the first time in, bio, in the Bible you see something. Did you catch it? Podium. Podium. It's actually, in the Hebrew, it's tower of wood, which is, in essence, what this is. There were six on his right hand, seven on his left. And notice, are they standing next to him, or is he up in the tower and they're standing on the ground? I kind of think it's that, but we don't know for sure. Um, and so, who are these people? Normally, the Bible will tell you. If they're priests, it'll say they're priests. It doesn't say they are. I get the idea that in all likelihood, this could be just regular men that perhaps Ezra appointed to read the scriptures when he grew weary. And don't you think it's interesting that they're not at the temple, they're at the water gate. So these two factors kind of uh, proves out something that the Bible is for everyone. Not just the learned, not just the, the quote unquote clergy. It's for everyone. Continuing on, verse 5 and 6, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So as soon as he stands up, everybody else stands up. And when they realize they're opening, he's opening the word, that's when the people throw up their hands, shout out, amen, and then they fall to the ground with their face to the ground. Now, if you were to see this back then, you would think, what are they, charismatics? Um, and then once they fell to the ground with their face to the ground, you go, no, they're, they're Muslims. No, this is, the, this is the ancient way people would do things. The hands are raised in the air in the sense that we are dependent upon God. But they're faced to the ground. This is the way slaves bowed to their masters in ancient times. The idea is every part of me is on the ground. 
below this master. And so they knew that God was not simply their creator, but also the one that they would report to one day. And um, what you will see is revival is starting to take place here. You'll see in three attributes in just a moment. Verse 7 and 8. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Yozabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. There is a view that once the Jews were kicked out of the land and sent to Babylon, that, uh, that they forgot all their Hebrew. They only learned Aramaic. Now, they did pick up Aramaic, but there's a view here that Ezra is speaking in Hebrew and the people can't understand. So he has to stop, and then the Levites go around and explain it in Aramaic so they will understand. That may be correct, uh, and yet the... The interesting thing about it is the word translated here in the Hebrew, it says help to understand. I'm not certain that's what's going on here. I think in all likelihood, Ezra reads a bit, and then the, then the Levites explain the text. I think the people can understand the language. And the Levites go around to make sure that they fully grasp it, to help to understand it. It's literally, it says, to give the sense so that they might understand the reading. Isn't this what Dan and the rest of the elders do from week in and week out? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Although that's vitally and most important. It's also for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All right? So what we see here is that they were helping the people to explain it, to understand it. If you don't mind, I'd like to give you three attributes for teaching the Word of God. There's many, and too often times I don't do well at this. But I'll give you three attributes, and these are clearly seen in Scripture. The first one we'll put together is it needs to be accurate and clear. And that's the first one, and I intentionally put those two into one because I think they go together. 2 Peter 4.2 says, Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct Rebuke and encourage with great patience and what? Careful instruction. Let me tell you what. Even if you're teaching little kiddos at vacation Bible school, you should remember you're teaching the very word of God. So there should be some sort of trembling in it. We've got to make sure that we are accurate and clear. Um, Martin Luther had to deal with this. Uh, when, in the 1500s when he was preaching the word, there were some people that that wanted him to, to go higher because there were certain higher intellectually because some, some people were uh, used to being preached only to by intellectuals. And they gave Luther a hard time. And they said, come on, you can do better than that. But Luther was very uh, cognizant that there were many people in the congregation that couldn't even read and write. So he wasn't trying to make the teaching uh, too low, uh, but he wasn't also trying to make it too high either. He realized that he should teach both. He, people kept giving him such a hard time that finally he said, if educated people aren't impressed, the door is open. Let them be gone. Because one thing he wanted is he wanted not just accuracy, he wanted clarity. And that's one thing I am so thankful for the chapel for. For 60 plus years, there are opportunities to understand the scriptures here. Be they the sermons, uh, Sunday school classes, men, women, youth, children, there's Bible studies, okay? Because we want you to know this word. This is the thing that will change your life because this is the Spirit uses. This is what He uses. So we don't go light. I'm so thankful for that. Um, so it should be accurate and clear. The second thing, it should be the, the goal of our instruction is love. It's love. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Corinthians 8.1, it says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And so the idea is that it's not bad to have all this knowledge of Scripture, but you better make sure at the end of the day, it's about love. We want, you to, we want all of us to be able to love God more, to love our neighbor, especially the brethren, and then to love enemies too. And if that's not taking place through the preaching of the Word, that's a problem. 
so thankful that, that uh, Dan uh, goes with the ultimate goal of our instruction is love, along with the rest of the elders. And then finally, the third thing, it should be applied to life. After Jesus is washing the feet of his apostles, uh, you can imagine them watching what he's doing. And uh, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So I don't think the apostles left taking notes and saying, okay, how did he put the foot in the water? Okay. And when he pulled it back out, at what point did he start to bathe it? it did he wait a few seconds? And then when he dried, was it more of a drying on top and then bottom, or was it a flipped? No. It's ridiculous. Because Jesus is making it very clear. Wash all the feet that you want. I mean, rather, rather listen to what I'm saying, but if you're not doing it, there's a problem. Let me tell you. It is dangerous to study the Word of God without obeying. No, that's wrong. It's damning to study the Word of God without the goal of obeying. This is what the Pharisees did. Pharisees said, I want to know the Scriptures. I don't want to do them. I just want to know it. Right? And this is, this is what Calvin uh, was very clear about. There should be, by God's grace, the Spirit working through you. There should be the doing of the Word. He says, uh, he didn't view theology as an end in itself. He said, when I expound Holy Scripture, I must always make this my rule that those who hear me may receive profit from the teaching I put forward and be edified unto salvation. If I do not procure the edification of those who hear me, I'm a sacrilege. I'm profaning God's word. The word of God is not to teach us to prattle. I had to look up that word. I don't know what that means. Prattle means foolish talk. Nor is it to make us eloquent and subtle, and I know not what. It is to reform our life so that it is known that we desire to serve God, to give ourselves entirely to Him, and to conform ourselves to do His good will. You know what he's saying, right? He's saying Matthew 28, 20, that we're supposed to make disciples of all nations, right? Teaching them to, it says observe. Observe is really not the best translation. Observe, I observe that it's sunny today. It's not the idea. Observe is, is this Greek word that means to keep it. As a matter of fact, the New English translation translates it as teaching them to obey all that is written. So ultimately, we don't hold to knowledge-based discipleship here at the chapel. Praise the Lord. Knowledge is important. You have to have knowledge. But we believe in obedience-based discipleship. That ultimately, you're taking the Word and the Spirit is flushing it out in your life. And showing you how to live it. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Here we see the first characteristic that true revival is taking place, and that is repentance. Spurgeon puts it this way. Under the teaching of Ezra... The people were awakened and cut to the heart, and they felt the edge of the law of God like a sword opening up their hearts, tearing, cutting, and killing. So the way it worked was like this. As the people heard that God is holy, and He is righteous, and we are not like Him, there is none like Him. And then they read a little bit more about the law and what would happen to them. And they break into repentant tears. Now, before I go any further, I should tell you this. They tell them, don't mourn. Why would they tell them not to mourn? Well, because I told you, this is on the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was a happy occasion. You don't do any work. You rejoice in the Lord. You celebrate God's goodness. When you consider the Hebrew uh, holidays, the festivals, uh, there's about five to six, depending upon how you gauge them. But all of them, minus one, were about happiness, joy, finding your joy in the Lord, taking rest from your troubles. There's only one, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where you would have fasting and crying. And so these people were crying at the Feast of Trumpets. And Nehemiah is going to correct that here. But we'll talk a little bit more about the repentance here. Verse 10 then he said to them, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. 
For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Literally, he says, eat the fat and drink the sweet. Now, I don't barbecue, uh, but my brother-in-law certainly does. He's a grill master. And he will tell me, with making brisket, with maybe any other meat, you leave the fat in there. It seems to me against good conscience, but you leave it in there because that's where all the flavor, and he's, he's right. Um, and that's what they're saying here. They're saying you go out and have the best food and have the best drink, and you enjoy. Why? Because this day is holy to the Lord. Don't be grieved. And this phrase right here, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I memorized that verse in the past, and perhaps you have too, and I'm going to challenge your understanding of it, as I was challenged, because that word, the joy of the Lord is your strength, is ma'uz zekem, ma'uz zekem, your strength. And quite honestly, when you look throughout the Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's not translated as strength many times. It can be, but really, the best translation, it is a place of safety. It's translated as fortress. Actually, the Holman Christian Standard surprisingly does a good job. It says, the joy of the Lord is your stronghold. What are they saying here? Well, let me, let me remind you. They've been reading about God's holiness and He's righteous. And then it starts talking about your judgments prescribed by the law in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 27. There's fever, consumption, enemy attacks, plague, pestilence. The people are scared, and the people are rightfully not just scared, but repentant. They realize that this God is holy and righteous, and I am wicked, and God is bringing them repentance. And so what Nehemiah seems to be saying is that be joyful, because your protection is in the Lord. Your ma'uzekim, not just your strength, that's your fortress. So the idea is this, is God is throwing down judgments of, oh, uh, no food and uh, drought and uh, plague. But with his other hand, he's saying, would you get underneath this? Run into the fortress and I will protect you. The only goodness that you have, the only joy you have is in me. So get under the fortress. Get in the fortress. Run inside. You know, there's, this, this generation does it, but another generation later on doesn't do it. And I bet you know which one I speak of. Right? Well, Maybe. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks, where? Under her wings. But you were not willing. So Jesus blames it squarely on them and saying, I want to protect you from God's judgments that are not only going to happen for eternity, but are going to happen in AD 70 when the Romans are going to destroy you but you are not willing. By God's grace, through the Spirit of God, these people are willing. And so Nehemiah looks at them and he says, be joyful, your protection is in the Lord. God's not going to destroy you. As a matter of fact, God's going to give you mercy because your sins are covered. You are the people of God. And by the way, if that's not true of the Old Testament, which it is, it's also true of the New, especially. Although we deserve God's judgment, we are protected from God's wrath because sins are not just covered for us, but what are they? They're forgiven. Our sins aren't just covered. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. So God's judgments have already fallen on his only begotten son. Isn't that what it says in Ephesians 2? That we are by nature children of wrath, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So what happened? The Word of God came to us through the Spirit of God, and what did we do? We ran into the fortress, and that's our only joy. The joy of the Lord is our fortress. Verse 11 and 12. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because the, they understood the words which had been made known to them. So they go away, they eat and drink. And by the way, this is just as a side note, the importance of a fellowship meal. God does this with his covenants. He brings the Mosaic covenant and they have a meal. 
the new covenant, and they have the Lord's Supper. At the end of days, we will be having the wedding supper of the Lamb. Let me tell you what, God is very interested in eating and drinking. All right? He made it for us. Taste buds are not necessary. Being able to smell wonderful foods is not necessary for life. And yet, it's very and vitally important to God. And so the people are going to celebrate one other thing they're going to do. And what is that thing? It's the same thing, uh, same command that was told Paul on his first missionary journey. Go out and preach the gospel, but they only ask one other thing, and that is for them to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do, says in Galatians 2.10. Uh, so the people are going to go out there, and they're going to provide for those that don't have any, and they're going to bring them back in, and they're going to celebrate. It's going to be a sweet time. And notice this. We see the second characteristic of revival. Because they understood the words which had been made known to them, they are rejoicing. The fact is God loves me. Somebody as wicked as me, and they are rejoicing at that. Do you know how many times the Scripture uh, gives you commands to be joyful? I've read it's over 200 times. And so let's talk for just a moment about sadness and joy, because we've dealt with really both of these. Number one, there are times for us to demonstrate sadness in our relationship to the Lord, Th proving through Scripture. There's times we should demonstrate sadness. Uh, the first one would be a, a one-time justification, repentance unto life. When you became a believer, the other side of the coin of faith was repentance. It was not a separate work. It was given to you at the same time. And there was this heartfelt, oh, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against the holy God my whole life. How can the world could he ever take me? And that's your repentance. It's a gift of God, according to 2 Timothy 2. And there's sadness. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I love the way Jerome said it in the 4th century. Let a man grieve in his sin. Rather, rather, let a man grieve for his sin, and then joy for his grief. Hey, you better rejoice that you actually get sad when you sin, because that's a mark of a believer. And not just remorse, but true repentance. And that is the second aspect of this uh, times of sadness, is there should be an ongoing sanctification repentance, right? Isn't this what the scriptures say? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not necessary for our justification, but our sanctification is important for us to confess when we fall into sin or dive into sin. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, where Paul is instructing the Corinthians about the sinning brother, they've done church discipline on him, and then it says, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Paul does not condemn the man for being sorrowful. He's starting to get upset with the Corinthians because he's saying, you're going to let this guy hang out to dry. He's, he's sorrowful. Bring him back. Lest he be given away to excessive sorrow. There's the concern. Peter, we know that he went out and wept after he denied Christ the third time. It's okay to be sad in the Lord's presence, especially if it's regarding our sin. One other aspect of that is in our prayers to the Father, sometimes there's great sadness. The man who, by inspiration of the Spirit, could say, Rejoice always, Paul, can also say in Romans 9, 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What is Paul saying? Paul, you're supposed to rejoice always. And he would look back and go, No, I disagree. Yes, I'm supposed to rejoice always, rejoicing in the Lord, but at the same time, there's this heart here that reaches out to my fellow Jews that have not come to Christ. And so it's not either or, it's, it's both and. When we pray for others, it's okay to weep for them. It's okay to be sad. Second aspect of sadness and joy would be this. Number two, a believer's life should be personified by joy. It's not fake. We are supposed to say our joy is in the Lord, right? We see Paul and Silas that are stuck in stocks, and they are singing. That's joy in the Lord. I love Philippians 3.1 that says it like this. Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. That's interesting, that term safe. Take the flip side of that and would say this. If you're rejoicing in things that are not the Lord, and it can be your family, it could be your job, it could be your health, be careful doesn't mean we shouldn't have happiness, but
but it means be careful if you're finding your joy in those things. The reason why is because it's not safe for you. Your legs are going to give out one day. Your brain will not keep working for you the way it is now. You will lose family. You will lose friends. Be careful. It is dangerous to find your joy outside the Lord. And now go back to what the scripture is saying. Rejoice in the Lord. It's safe for you. Why? Because he's the rock that cannot move. He's the one you should find your joy in. Verse 13 through 15. Then on the second day, the heads of fathers' households of all the people, the priest and the Levites were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the book how the Lord had, made, had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. We saw the first characteristic of God bringing life is repentance. The second one we saw was joy. What's the third one? It's obedience, right? They go actually back to Ezra and, and say, read us some more. And they read, he reads more of the scripture and they say, what did you say? Feast of booths? Okay, let's do it. And they gather around them lean-tos, pup tents, and they do this for a week because this was prescribed by the law to make these sort of booths with these branches, these shelters, if you would, for your family. What they would do is ultimately they're going to reenact the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. It's prescribed by the Lord. Why would they do that? Well, the Bible tells you to remember your past and remember the faithfulness of the Lord. So important for Christians to remember as we pray God's faithfulness. And not only that, but notice you're going to now recommit yourself to the Lord and to His law. And that's what the Feast of Booths was about. Verse 16 and 17, So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts, in the courts of the house of God, in the square at the water gate, in the square at the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was great rejoicing. Well, it says that this had not been done since Joshua. Well, that doesn't square with Scripture, does it? Ezra chapter 3, verse 4, they are actually having a feast of booths. No, I think what the author is saying, which is the Spirit, is saying there had never been a feast of booths like this one before. That they were all throughout Jerusalem and they had put up these lean-tos everywhere. There was literally, uh, most historians think there was 50, at least 50,000 to 100,000 people living in booths all over that part of the city and beyond. And notice this, there was great rejoicing. Well, if you think about it, Nothing has changed for the Israelites, for the Jews. I mean, they now have a wall, yes, but they're still under the foot of Persia. They're still not their own nation. They still have great difficulties, and yet they're rejoicing greatly. Um, it reminds me of old Billy Sunday, who was an early 20th century evangelist in America. <laughs> he went over to somebody's house, and he was petting the cat, and the owner of the cat said, you're, you're rubbing the cat the wrong way. And his answer was, turn the cat around. And this picture of, hey, this isn't working right. Well, you need to change your attitude. And God had given them an attitude of joy, an amazing attitude of joy, that they, they can now rejoice and listen to me. Their circumstances have not really changed. But I would note this, obedience does lead to joy. We are now walking in the ways of God. Doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. Taking up your cross is very difficult for a believer. I know that. We do it every day, Lord willing. But note this. Who's the one who created joy? Who's the one who gives it as a fruit of the Spirit? Right? And finally, verse 18. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day, and they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. So in chapter 9, we'll find out we have a solemn assembly coming. Uh, it's probably a day of renewal to the Lord. Luke 8, 18 says this, Believer's Chapel. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. 
And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. This reminds me of the parable of the soils. You had the seed, which is the gospel, fall upon the path and the rocks and the thorns and finally the good ground. And the good ground is where we would say that's where the true believer is, where 30 and 60, 100 fold come up. But what is interesting to me, or maybe the most intriguing, was the one that grows up among the thorns. Mark 4.19, it says, But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Beware, believer. Other things. The Bible doesn't tell you what are those other things. It's intentionally nebulous. You can fill in your blank. Be careful. You may be wandering today and you don't even know it. You think, I'm at church here today. I'm not wandering. Oh, contraire. You may very well be wandering. The Lord is the one who gives life. Pray for you as believers that God would grant you the grace to repent today. Whatever path you may be on, you've been backsliding. And if you're honest with yourself, you may very well know it. If you're an unbeliever today, you should note this. Some of us in here don't have the joy of the Lord because He is not your fortress. You are not prepared for the wrath of God. You are not prepared for the coming judgment, which quite honestly will come with the last breath that comes out of your mouth, and you don't know when it's going to come. Let me tell you this. God in His grace, let me tell you the gospel. God in His grace made this world. He didn't have to have anything, but He made the universe. And with that, He made it right and good and then he made Adam and Eve our first parents. And it says, you can have any tree. Eat of any tree of the garden. But except for one. That's to show the sense that ultimately, sorry, I got too excited. Um, <laughs> as to show that ultimately what happened is that, will you obey me? It's just one area that you will obey me in. Will you obey me? And they say, No. And they fell into sin. And get this, we're their kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. We are the people of Adam and Eve. And we are sinners, not simply by birth, but by choice as well. The Bible makes it very clear we were made to glorify God. But we fell way short of that, according to Romans 3.23. And the bad news gets worse. Romans 6.23 says, for the payment, the wages of sin is death. One day you will die and report to the Lord, and he will look down at you. And it says, here's your payment. I never knew you. Depart from me into the lake of fire. Um, you will receive payment for this life of not glorifying the Lord, of seeking your own desires. But listen to me. Here's the good news. God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was born into the world a baby. That's why we celebrate Christmas. And not only that, but he lived the perfect life you and I could never live. Perfect, holy, keeping every jot and tittle of the commandments. And then he would offer himself freely for the sins of the world. Romans 4, 5 says he was delivered over because of our transgressions. But get this, three days later, God rose him again because for our justification. That's why we celebrate Easter. And you say, yes, Jeff, I know. I was raised in that. I understand. But listen to me. You're not a believer until you come to place, according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for my grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. Today, let me encourage you to run to the fortress of Christ, forsaking all ways to save yourself, because any good thing you've done is nothing more than paving stones onto the steps of hell. By the way, that's not the end of the story, just your salvation of coming to Christ. The Bible makes it very clear that one day the skies will rip open and Jesus Christ will appear in the flesh. I may die even today. My body goes to the ground. My spirit goes to be with the Lord. But one day, body and soul come back together again in a sweet embrace. And God will judge the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And he will make all things new. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, come to him. Run to the fortress in your son's name. Father, thank you for your gift. Thank you for your constant 
and never-ending love towards us. And I pray that you would just grant anybody in here that does not yet know Jesus as their Savior, would you grant them the joy of the Lord by causing the Spirit to get them up and run to the fortress of Christ. In the name of Jesus, above all names, we pray. Amen. Amen.